The Kenwood receiver has been in storage for quite a while, so before plugging it in for the first time, I wanted to remove the cover and do a quick visual inspection. And everything looks pretty good, just a lot of dust and the requisite dead critter, in this case a spider. And I see no obvious physical signs of component damage, no blown capacitors or resistors, so we're ready to power it on for the first time, but let's do that with an added measure of safety. Here I have the Kenwood plugged into my current limiter, which is plugged into my Variac slash isolation transformer, and we'll use these devices to slowly power on our Kenwood while monitoring our dim bulb for signs of shorts. Now I know exactly what some of you are thinking right now. Flux Condenser just stated that his Variac is also an isolation transformer. This man is a monster and must be stopped. Let me stop this video and go right to the comment section to tell him just how wrong he is. Well, put your pitchforks down for a second and let me explain. Yes, it's true, most variacs are not isolation transformers. They're autoformers that simply provide variable AC outputs. Now I've read time and time again in the comment section to my videos that all variacs are this way. However, that's simply not the case and Variac do make products that provide variable AC outlet with the additional feature of isolation. And you can see on the front panel of our Variac, it's clearly stated that it has an output of 0 to 130 volts AC at 60 Hertz and it is isolated. This is confirmed by Variac's literature for this model, the schematic they provide, and also by my own tests. In this particular Variac, there is no physical connection between the hot and neutral input and the hot and neutral output. Now yes, the ground input is connected to the ground output, but this is simply to satisfy the safety requirements required to sell a product in the United States and many other countries. And it's simply not an issue for the vast majority of the components I work on, particularly with vintage units, because as you can see, they only have two prongs and no ground connection. Now to provide isolation for components that have a three prong grounded outlet, Variac simply instructs you to use a cheater plug. I have one here and you would simply plug the cheater into the Variac and then plug your three prong component into the cheater. This will provide complete isolation from your unit under test to your home's AC wiring. Well, hopefully some of you found that informative and clears up some confusion about these Variacs. Let's continue now with powering up our Kenwood. Let's take our cheater out, we don't need that. Plug the Kenwood back directly into the Variac. And again, we'll ramp up the voltage slowly while monitoring our dim bulb for any indications of shorts. And as the voltage dial on our Variac isn't particularly accurate, you can also watch this monitor to see the actual AC voltage being provided to the Kenwood. The Variac is in the zero volts position. Let's turn the Variac on now. And now let's turn on the current limiter and let's turn up our voltage. Okay, there's a good sign, did you hear that? The relay has just clicked on on the Kenwood and we're at about 100 volts. No glow from the dim bulb, so let's ramp it up to a full 120 volts. No problems detected, great. Now in this view, you can't see the front panel of our Kenwood, but I can confirm that the LEDs are glowing. So now let's turn our attention to the Fluke multimeter. You can see I have it connected to the speaker outputs of the Kenwood. And this is to confirm that there's no potentially harmful DC voltage on our speaker outputs. So we can make sure that it's safe to connect our speakers. Let's put the Fluke into DC mode and make sure we don't have any significant voltage. Here we go. Looks good, no significant DC voltage shown. So that's a good sign. The Fluke is connected to the left channel. Let's connect it to the right channel now. Also looks good. Let's hook up some speakers to the Kenwood now and an audio input and see how well it's working. I have to apologize. I think I referred to this earlier as a receiver, but as you can see, it's actually a stereo integrated amplifier. So like a receiver, but with no tuner. There's also a matching tuner that goes with this. My friend dropped that off as well, and maybe we'll take a look at that later. Let's now play some music through the amp to verify the problem that my friend reported, and that is that the balance control is not working properly, and there wasn't a lot of output from the right channel. In the back of the unit, I have this Bluetooth receiver connected to the CD slash auxiliary input, and I'm streaming some music to this from the YouTube library. Let me press play now on my player and see what we get. Okay, we're getting some pretty clean output so far.
Okay, and I've switched to the right channel and definitely diminished output there. Let's switch to the left channel. And yep, we've definitely got more output on the left channel. Let me turn up the volume now and I'll slide between the left and right. Okay, so you can hear that the control is very intermittent. And even in the fully right position, I'm still getting some output from the left. So hopefully the problem is just in the balance control and maybe some control cleaner will clear up the issue. So that'll be our first attempt at a repair. Before we do that though, let's check some of the other features on the amp to make sure we don't have any other issues that need investigation. Let's try out the equalizer first. Let's put the equalizer into the on position. And I'll play some music now and we'll test out these sliders. Here we go. Okay, that seems to be working. Let me turn the equalizer off and now let's try the loudness control. And that seems to be working, boosting the low bass notes. Let's observe the meter now. There are two range positions, we'll switch between them. Yeah, that seems to be working fine. Let's turn the volume control up and down now to see how scratchy it is and whether it needs cleaning. Yeah, pretty scratchy, we'll need to clean that. Okay, finally, let's quickly check the speaker switch. You can choose between speaker set A and B. These speakers are connected to set A, so let me turn up the volume and we'll turn this on and off and make sure that's working. Yeah, that checks out. So, so far the only obvious problem we have with the amp seems to be with the balance. Let's take a closer look now at the control and see if we can fix the issue. I took the front panel of the amp off to get a better view of the balance control. And here you can see how it works when I slide from left to right. Now you may look at this and think that I've removed the cover to the control as the resistive track is clearly exposed. But no, this is the way the control is installed into the amp with absolutely no cover and fully exposed to dust and other debris. And you can see here in the corner just how much dust accumulates in a unit like this over the years. So it's no wonder that we're having troubles with this control. Now when you slide the control from left to right, it does sort of clean the track. But this is obviously a very poor design and a very low quality control. Now if you saw the series I just completed on that Heathkit preamplifier, you'll remember that I went on and on about the high quality components that Heathkit included with that kit, particularly with the controls. And when you see a control like this on another product, you really start to understand and see why some audio components cost so much more than others. Going beyond the specs, cheap audio gear is often made of cheap components. And with apologies to my friend, this is a relatively cheap piece of audio gear built with pretty cheap components. Now, of course, he knew this when he bought this back in the day, and he was the one that was prepared to throw this amplifier in the trash. I'm the one that said, hold on. And that's because even though this is an inexpensive amp and not built to the highest quality standards, when operating correctly, there's no reason that this amp can't provide good quality, high fidelity sound. And it certainly deserves a little attention to see if we can get it fixed and doesn't belong in the landfill. So let's see if there's any hope left in this control and we'll attempt to clean it out. Now even high quality fader style controls can be fairly fragile. That's because they're made of plastic components and really should only be cleaned by specialty products made just for fader controls. But even when that's done, these fader style controls can be very difficult to repair. And sometimes cleaning them only makes the situation worse. And the other problem is once these faders are damaged, it's often irreparable. And the only solution is to pull them out and replace them. 
And that, of course, can be extremely difficult as there's so many different sizes of these faders and finding a replacement that's going to work with your gear can be almost impossible. I'll try to clean out this control with Deoxit Fader F5, a product that should be well suited to cleaning this out, and we'll cross our fingers that it works. If not, we may need to cut this balance control completely out of the circuit, which really isn't a huge problem as most people don't even use the balance control. I'm going to start by dripping just a couple of quick little bursts into the fader. Just a little bit. And now let's slide the fader control back and forth to try to work that solution in. Okay, I don't see the track breaking apart or lifting, so that's a good sign. However, the dirt and residue seems to be sort of just pooling on top of the track. Let's see if we can gently soak some of that out with a Q-tip. Going to apply a little more of the spray. And we'll try to sponge up the mess with another Q-tip. Another spray of the cleaner. Yeah, let's sponge that up. Finally, I'm going to use this foam sponge. Now let's work that back and forth. Okay, that's probably enough for now. Let's play some music and see if that helped. I've got the unit powered on, some speakers connected, and some music playing through it. Let's slide the balance control back and forth to see if we fixed anything. Turn up our volume. Okay, the control seems to be far less intermittent now. I'm not getting any scratchy sound. That's a good sign. But still on the right channel, we have diminished output. Let me turn up the volume and experiment with this a bit. Okay, again, the balance control seems to be working just fine now. But again, still, no matter what position I put the balance control in or the volume, we're getting diminished output on the right channel. Now, this could be an indication that the balance control isn't at fault, but actually the volume control. Because remember, the volume control on a stereo unit actually has two gangs, one for the left channel and one for the right. So it's essentially two potentiometers in one. You'll also notice, too, that when the volume control is in its lowest position, we're still getting a lot of sound bleed through coming through the speakers, indicating again that the volume control potentiometer could be faulty. So now that we've cleaned up the balance control, I think we should now try to clean up the volume control potentiometer. Let me unplug everything and we'll give that a try now. Here's a better view of the volume control. Again, it's a stereo control and you can see that it has two gangs, one here and one there. One is for the left channel and the other the right. Now we have good access from this angle to spray some cleaner into the control. You can see that there's two large openings on the top here. So for this control, I'm going to use my MG Chemicals Neutral Control Cleaner, which I usually have pretty good luck with. Now right below this potentiometer is the balance control. And as I showed you, the resistive track in that control is wide open. So when we flush out this volume control, we really don't want all of that residue dripping down below. So to protect it, I've covered the balance control with some electrical tape and stuffed in some paper towels to absorb the drippings. Let's spray some cleaner in the control. And once I've done that, I'll rotate the shaft of the control back and forth to really activate that cleaner. And then we'll spray some more and repeat the process. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, what do you think? Is that going to fix our problem? Let's give it a try. Yeah, that did the trick. I'm getting nice clean sound now from both the left and the right. And the amplitude seems to be the same between the two channels. Also note that in the lowest position of the control, there's no more sound bleeding through. And the intermittent crackling is completely gone. Okay, so looking like we're in really great shape. I'm going to let this control dry a little bit more. And I'll leave the paper towel installed for a bit longer to absorb any more further drippings. Once that's done, we'll do more listening tests to confirm that our balance and volume controls are working just fine and that we've fixed the problem. The controls have been sitting overnight. Let's remove the paper towels and electrical tape and test them one more time. Okay, here we go. Let's turn up the volume first. Sounds good. Let's try the balance control now. Works great. Now I'm just going to spend a little time cleaning up the amp. As you can see, there's quite a bit of dust and debris throughout. And you can see it even looks like there may be some mouse droppings. And there's dust everywhere. According to my friend, the Sam spent quite a bit of time in storage in a garage, which around here in the summertime can get quite humid. So I really expected to see some corrosion in the chassis. But the truth is, I see no corrosion at all. To make sure there's no corrosion on the bottom and also to give us more access for cleaning, let's flip the unit over and remove the bottom panels. Well, you can see in the bottom not a hint of rust. Let's remove this panel and take a closer look. Okay, it looks good. Again, just more dust. The first thing I notice is they didn't remove all the flux from the board on some of the connections. Not a big deal. And in quite a few places, they left a lot of these leads very long on the board. Not a huge problem, as the board has been laminated and there's not a lot of exposed copper. But right away, I see a lead that's dangerously close to touching another solder connection because the lead was simply left too long. Let me zoom up with the camera and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, here's the lead I'm talking about. Look how close that is to touching this solder ball. And check out the length of this lead. Now, fortunately, the extra long leads in this particular device apparently didn't create any problems over the years. But you have to wonder if Kenwood had some issues with some of their products because of this type of construction. Which frankly, again, is something you hopefully wouldn't see, and I certainly don't see a lot, in higher quality products. So I guess now, in addition to cleaning the unit, I'm going to spend a little time snipping some of these longer leads, just to be on the safe side. Before I do that though, I'm going to discharge the larger capacitors, just to make sure it's safe for me to work on these boards, and I can get my metal clippers in here without creating a spark. The terminals I'm concerned about for the two larger capacitors are here. Here's the negative and positive for one of them. And here's the negative and positive for the other. The unit is powered off, so let's put our multimeter probes on these terminals to see how much residual voltage is left in those capacitors. Here we go. Okay, yeah, the first one is completely drained. No problem there. Let's check the other. And the same for this one. So it's safe to proceed, and I can spend a little time clipping some of those extra long leads. I've got the unit outside now. Let's use our powered air duster to blow out the dust. And if that doesn't remove all the debris, I'll use some electronics cleaner as well. Here we go.
I spent a lot of time cleaning up the amp and it's looking pretty good. Let's move on now and do a quick listening test of the phono section. The amp only has an input for a moving magnet cartridge, but for now I'm going to test it with the moving coil cartridge I now have installed in this turntable. I do have another turntable in the house set up with a moving magnet cartridge, but because of the way that one's set up, it's a little bit different to bring onto the bench. And for a quick test, this will work just fine. Now, because it's a moving coil cartridge, which has a much lower output than a moving magnet cartridge, the gain's not going to be very high, and we'll have to really turn up the volume, and we might hear a little bit of excess noise. Let's spin the disc and hear how it sounds. Sounds pretty good and no obvious problems with the phono section. So the amp seems to be fixed, but for fun, let's put it back together and do some tests. We'll test its frequency response, total harmonic distortion, signal to noise ratio, and more. And let's find the manual for this thing and find out how many watts per channel it's supposed to crank out. And we'll verify that too with our tests. Okay, let's look online and see if we can find some literature for the amplifier. For stereo gear, my favorite place to find manuals is hifiengine.com. Here I often find not only owner's manuals, but service manuals, schematics, and all types of product literature. Let's search for the Kenwood KA76 and see what we find. Okay, it looks like we found something here. Yeah, there it is, Kenwood KA76 Stereo Integrated Amplifier, sold between 1987 and 1988. And for specifications, it says this unit is capable of 100 watts per channel. Wow, that's a lot more than I was guessing. Can that be right? I thought this amp might be in the 40 to 50 watt range, but nowhere near 100 watts. Well, we're just going to have to put that claim to the test. Okay, we have a few documents down here that are available. A flyer, an instruction slash owner's manual, and also a schematic. Let's check the flyer first. Uh, looks like this is only in another language. What is that, German, Dutch? Let's click it and find out. Okay, here we go, and here's the KA76. This one is saying 65 watts per channel, but that's into four ohms. So it could still be 100 watts into eight ohms. Let's check the owner's manual and see what that says. Okay, here we go. Let's scroll down here. Okay. Let's go to the specifications at the end and see what this one says. Okay, interesting, it's saying output should be 100 watts per channel and that's not peak power, that's RMS. And supposedly it does it from 20 to 20,000 hertz with very little total harmonic distortion, only 0.05%. These are impressive claims. Again, we'll have to put that to the test. Okay, now this is pretty interesting. Read this line, music power output at eight ohms, except for USA and Canada. 225 watts plus 225 watts for a total of 450 watts. Yeah, see, that's the peak power measurement, 225 watts per channel. This is really a bogus measurement, and you can see that the USA and Canada were having none of that. And at the time that this amp was made, the US had really cracked down on bogus claims for stereo equipment, requiring that they not be shown by peak power, but by RMS, and also over a full frequency range with minimum distortion. All right, let's see what else we have here. Total harmonic distortion at rated output, that's 0.05%, we'll check that. Intermodulation distortion, 0.03%. And frequency response is a claim 10 hertz to 70 kilohertz, plus zero decibels to negative three decibels. Okay, let's put these claims to the test. I've got everything set up now to do our power test. I'm pretty excited and I don't know quite what to expect. Again, the amp claims to have 100 watts per channel of output, but honestly, I'm not so sure. I don't know, maybe it's the inclusion of the graphic equalizer or the overall build quality that has me somewhat suspect. Then again, considering that this isn't a receiver, the unit is pretty hefty. And you know, the power transformer, output transistors, and heat sinks look like they might actually be up to the job, so who knows? Now to reach 100 watts per channel, we're going to need to see about 28.25 volts here in the left and right channels. Now the DAC that I'm using won't accept that full voltage, so I have it connected to a 10 to 1 voltage divider. So what we're looking to see is about 2.8 volts here on our scale. And to reach the claim of 100 watts per channel, the output needs to be clean. So over here on the left, I have an oscilloscope running, and we can monitor the 1 kilohertz sine wave. And we want that sine wave to be nice and smooth at the top. No flattening, which will indicate clipping. Okay, let's run our test. 
Okay, again, we're looking for 2.85 volts here in the left and right channel. So far, we're at about 1.1, and you can see that the sine wave is nice and clean. Let's keep turning the volume up. Still a nice clean sine wave, let's continue. Wow, would you look at that? Okay, almost at 2.85. Will it do it? Wow, look at that. Okay, folks, that's over 100 watts per channel, and the sine wave looks absolutely perfect. Maybe a little bit uh, off here. Let's turn that down a little bit, get that to smooth out a bit. Yep, and we're still within that 2.85 volts, so we're still putting out 100 watts per channel. Let's turn it up and see how far we can go. Right about there, we start seeing some significant distortion, but we're well over 100 watts per channel there. Pretty impressive. Kenwood specifies that the 100 watt per channel output is at 0.05% total harmonic distortion. Let's test this now to make sure that the amp can not only provide 100 watts per channel, but that it can do it at that low 0.05% total harmonic distortion. Now for the test that we just did, we use the oscilloscope to monitor the sine wave, and we look for signs of clipping. However, this really isn't precise enough to do a power test, because the output from the amplifier can actually have pretty significant distortion even before you can visually detect it by monitoring the sine wave. So let's run the test again, but this time let's also monitor the total harmonic distortion. And we can do that by clicking this button here, which shows us a total harmonic distortion window. So this time when we run the test, let's not focus so much on the oscilloscope reading, but on the total harmonic distortion rating. And let's see how many volts we can get when the THD is at 0.05 or below. Here we go. Well, you can see at the rated power of about 100 watts per channel, we're actually quite a bit higher than the 0.05 rating, coming in at about 0.15% total harmonic distortion. Still low, but not as good as claimed. Let's back down now and see how many watts we can get at 0.05. Okay, so to keep things at about 0.05 or below, we're at about 2.04 volts on the left channel and 2.09 on the right. So let's calculate how many watts we're actually getting at 0.05% distortion. To do this, we square the voltage and divide it by the impedance, which in this case is eight ohms or eight. So 20.4 squared is 416.16, divided by eight is 52. So we see that at the rated distortion, the power of the amp really isn't 100 watts, it's actually 52. And honestly, this doesn't surprise me because that seems more in line with what I expected from this amp. Nonetheless, the 100 watts per channel at 0.15 is still very good, and this amp is capable of outputting pretty high power with a pretty clean signal. Not quite as good as claimed, but for an amp of this class, still very good results. Let's test the harmonic distortion again, but this time let's use a different test. Instead of at just one frequency, this THD test will test harmonic distortion over the entire audio spectrum. So we'll get to see exactly where in the audio band the amplifier is producing the most and the least amount of harmonic distortion. And I'm going to run this test again with the amplifier output power at about 100 watts per channel. Here we go. Okay, so we can see that in both channels the distortion figures are closely matched, and that's a good indication that the amplifier is working as it's supposed to. And again, as we saw with the other test, the distortion at about 100 watts per channel is just about 0.15%. But that's only true for frequencies at about 1 kHz and below, and we can see that at the higher frequencies, the distortion is only at about 0.02%. So these numbers are good, and I think we can safely still call this amplifier a 100 watt per channel amplifier. Again, it's not as good at 100 watts as the rated 0.05% distortion, but 0.15%, 0.2% distortion is still fairly hard to detect. Let's test the frequency response of the amp now. The amp is rated for a frequency response of 10 Hz to 70 kHz at plus 0 decibels to minus 3. Let's run our frequency test now, and again this will be with the amp putting out 100 watts per channel. Here we go. Our frequency response looks great in both the left and right, we're getting a nice flat response. At about 1 kHz, we're at about 0.268 dB, and at 20, at 1.19, that's only a difference of 1.49 decibels, and well within the rated 3 decibel range. Good job! Kenwood states that at full output of 100 watts per channel, the intermodulation distortion should be no more than 0.03%, and that's with a tone at 60 Hz and one at 7 kHz with a 4 to 1 ratio. And you can see that's what I have set up here. Let's run the test now and see if we can get below 0.03%.
Okay, close, but once again, not quite. At 0.05%, the intermodulation distortion is just a bit above the 0.03% rating. But still, this is a pretty good result, so I don't see any issues here. Note that on the display for both the left and right channels, you can see the 60 hertz signal. This is here for the left and the one for the right and the 7000 hertz signal here on the left and the 7000 hertz signal on the right. And again, these are at a four to one amplitude ratio and you can see that the 60 hertz tone is at zero dB and the seven kilohertz tone is at minus 10, which amplitude wise equates to a four to one ratio. And here you can see the harmonics. Each of these peaks is a harmonic created by the two tones. And when we measure harmonic or intermodulation distortion, these peaks are actually what we're measuring. This peak is a second order harmonic, this a third, a fourth, and so on. And these harmonic signals are distortion because they don't actually exist in the original signal. They're generated through the process of amplification. And no matter how good your audio equipment, these harmonics are always created. The better your equipment is, hopefully the lower these peaks and therefore less distortion. And here we can see that these peaks are at least 70 decibels below the 60 hertz signal. And when noise starts getting below 70 decibels of the actual signal, it really becomes almost inaudible. So while with better equipment, these peaks would actually be lower. What we see here is still excellent. And again, this distortion is going to be virtually inaudible. Let's try a signal to noise ratio test now. Kenwood states that the signal to noise ratio should be 100 decibels. Based on what we've seen so far, I expect to see a pretty good signal to noise ratio, but I doubt it's going to get as high as 100 decibels. Let's give it a try. Okay, that's pretty much as I expected. As we saw earlier in the IMD test, the noise really is at about 70 decibels below the signal. And as I explained in that test, having this noise in these harmonics below 70 decibels of the signal is still very good and again, virtually inaudible. But once again, it seems that Kenwood has overstated the performance of the amp. Note here that in both the left and right channels, we see some hum at 60 hertz and 120 hertz. Now the 60 hertz hum comes from the AC signal in your home, which in America alternates 60 times a second. This 120 hertz hum is related to the 60 hertz hum and is the result of the full wave rectification going on in the amp. And here we can see the harmonics created by our signal, the second, third, fourth, and fifth, and also here on the right channel, the second harmonic, the third harmonic, the fourth, and the fifth. And note that these occur at even multiples of the signal. The signal is one kilohertz and the second harmonic is at two, the third at three, and the fourth at four, and so on and so on. Okay, you know, let's do one more test of the amp. Let's see how well it handles a square wave. My audio software can't output a clean square wave signal, so we're going to use the oscilloscope and an external square wave generator. I've got everything hooked up. Let's see how well the amplifier outputs a square wave signal at full 100 watts per channel output. Here we go. Yeah, it looks pretty good. I don't see any problems, and the amplifier is handling the square wave just fine. When I first saw the specs for this amp, I thought 100 watts per channel, yeah, right. And now I'm like 100 watts per channel, yeah, right. Based on our tests, I give it an overall good score. And I think that'll make my friend pretty happy. To stay updated, please subscribe to my channel and click the bell to receive notifications when I release new videos. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. I'll see you soon.